faith theory. So uh, this webinar is really all about um, just applying uh, these two uh, methodologies, uh, which um, in many respects are kind of uh, linked. Um, they are forward-looking um, uh, methodologies. And uh, unlike a lot of the um, uh, things like uh, moving averages and um, price patterns and things which are perhaps a bit more uh, lagging and uh, perhaps not as forward-looking uh, as, uh, as Elliott Wave uh, analysis. So without further ado, here we go. So the first, first slide here. So we're talking really about um, a guy called Fibonacci, who, who I'm sure you've, uh, you've, you've all heard of. Um, a guy, Libonacci Pisano, uh, named Fibonacci. He was an Italian mathematician in the 13th century. He traveled to India and he learned the uh, Hindu, Hindu uh, Arabic uh, numeral system and he brought it back to Europe um, and introduced it in his book, uh, Libonacci, the book of Abacus. And the way that, um, what, what, he, what he basically did was he, he kind of uh, speeded up the, um, the, you know, the, the the, the modernization um, of the business world um, in Italy um, in, um, uh, in, in, the, in that period. Um, so by bringing in the, um, the Hindu Arabic numeral system, um, it was an alternative to, um, to Roman numerals, which kind of made uh, business calculations uh, much easier to, um, to, to do. Um, while he um, while he was um, he, he was using his uh, his sequence, he solved a problem about um, rabbit reproduction, uh, and uh, he introduced this uh, this additive sequence uh, with, um, with with basically um, um, a, a sequence which starts off with one uh, one plus one equals two two plus one equals three uh, three plus two equals five and so on and so forth. So, so basically, um, it's a numeric sequence that um, it, it, it represents a, a growth spiral. Um, so each number is uh, is added to uh, the one uh, prior to it to produce the next number, and so on and so forth. So, as I say, each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. Uh, so the ratios that uh, you'll hear about in financial markets, Fibonacci ratios, um, and projections, that kind of thing. Um, they are derived from the, the two numbers. Um, so, so basically two numbers that are, that are next to each other. Um, each number is approximately 1.618 times the last number. Um, and each number is approximately 0.618 times the next number. In other words, one divided by 1.618. Uh, 1.618 is called pi or the golden ratio or golden mean. So pi appears frequently in the natural world, atomic structure, DNA molecules, planetary distances, uh, the brain, the nervous system, all over the universe, um, this, uh, this, magic, um, this magic number or ratio pi uh, appears. So why is this relevant with regards to financial markets? Well, the theory is that uh, if it's present in nature, nature governs mass psychology and mass psychology drives the financial markets. So one would expect to see uh, this, um, uh, this phenomenon um, active in the markets um, and govern to some extent the way that the markets move. So how do traders use Fibonacci numbers? Well, Obviously, retracements are quite important because um, if you've followed the, the previous um, uh, one or two uh, webinars that I did, um, there is um, a, a group of traders that like to, um, like to use retracements to get in after a swing in the direction of the trend. So what we're looking for as swing traders is a swing in the direction of the trend and then a pullback. And when we get the pullback, we're looking to enter a trade in the direction of the trend. So we're looking for retracement levels of the previous swing to give us the location to enter uh, a market in the direction uh, of the previous swing. So Fibonacci ratios come in here because a lot of traders use Fibonacci ratios to calculate these retracement levels of the previous swing. So Fibonacci ratios, for example, uh, 23.6, 38.2, 61.8, and 76.4 percentage levels of the previous swing. Also, people will use Fibonacci uh, will use 50% uh, 
uh, retracement, although this is not actually a Fibonacci ratio, um, it's a very common ratio to use for, uh, for pullbacks. So Fibonacci, so, so when, you, when you draw um, a Fibonacci uh, retracement um, uh, box uh, you, or table, you will see 50% in there with the other Fibonacci retracement levels. So what strategies could we use to, uh, to enter the market uh, after a pullback uh, towards Fibonacci ratio levels? Well, one thing that, that uh, traders will do is they will define the swing in the direction of the trend and they will calculate the Fibonacci levels. In fact, most uh, computer charting packages will enable you to easily identify a swing high, a swing low, and it will draw these Fibonacci retracement levels of the swing that you've identified. So you'll draw the swing, swing low to swing high if you're looking to buy the pullback, and uh, you'll have the 23.6, 38.2, 50%, 61.8, and 76.4 retracement levels. So what to do at these levels? Well, you could place buy limit orders at each of these levels or some of these levels according to which ones uh, you use. Um, or you could alternatively wait for a pullback into this uh, Fibonacci zone. And then once we get into or around one of these levels to wait for some signs of uh, renewed demand before you uh, enter a trade in the direction of the swing. So a, a couple of choices there. One, to, to buy the retracement levels, just to put the buy, buy limit orders in at the levels or two, to wait for the market to pull back towards one or two of the levels, and then to wait for signs of reversal before jumping into the market. Okay, so this is kind of how um, a bull swing would look with the Fibonacci retracement levels drawn um, on the chart from the swing. So the market breaks down to swing low, makes a, a, a quite a sharp move in the um, higher swing, up, up to the swing high. Then it pulls back. So as the market pulls back, that's when you draw your Fibonacci retracement levels. So you're going from swing low to swing high, and you will have the calculation of these levels. They will come in like this. Similarly, if you're looking to sell after a big swing to the downside, then again, you're looking to, number one, define the swing lower, to define the fact that the market has broken lower and that you wait, you're waiting to sell after a corrective bounce. And again, you, have, um, you can calculate swing high to swing low. You've got 23.6, 38.2, 50, 61.8, and 76.4. So again, either you're looking to place limit orders, in this case, sell limit orders at some of these levels, looking for the market to bounce, and then you automatically go short looking for a breakdown, or you're waiting for the market to, to bounce up to one of these levels to form a top and then to start to break lower. And that will give you the, uh, the impetus to take a stab at the short side, maybe place a, um, a stop loss above the swing high or the corrective high and look for new swing lows. Okay, so just an example of buying after a pullback. First thing you do is identify a sharp or impulsive advance um, and then wait for the advance to top out. Then calculate the Fibonacci retracement levels using swing high minus swing low. Monitor price action looking for signs of demand near the Fibonacci levels. Uh, for example, you could be looking for um, a bullish price pattern on a, um, a bar chart or a candlestick chart. You could even go down a time frame or two on smaller charts, perhaps an intraday chart, and then look for some kind of reversal pattern um, or a break of a minor swing high on a, um, a smaller time frame chart. Also, you could be looking at bullish indicator readings, for example. You identify the swing, high, uh, the, the move higher, then you see the pullback, and then you're looking for perhaps an oversold reading on the, on the charts before you take a stab at the long side, looking to buy after a corrective pullback. And once you're in, obviously, you're looking either to place a stop under the pullback low, or a stop perhaps under the lowest level, the 76.4. Uh, a couple of things that you could do depending on which way you, you want to use these levels. Okay, um, this is the kind of example of the market um, doing a, a break to the upside, to swing low to swing high, then correcting lower to the 38.2. This is kind of just an example of how you might be a bit more uh, surgical in terms of identifying the corrective low and getting in with a tight stop. 
So the market breaks down, swings higher in an impulsive fashion, very sharp move higher. Then it starts to correct and we're looking to buy. Um, we come back towards the 38.2% retracement level, which is a lot more common than seeing the market back to the 23.6 level. That's usually um, not, uh, not quite as common. So back to the 38.2% retracement level, we see signs of demand and then we enter long and place a stop under the corrective low. Uh, short side, um, identify a sharp decline or impulsive decline to the downside. Wait for the decline to base out, then you start to see a correction. Calculate your Fibonacci retracement levels from swing high to swing low. And then monitor price action around some of these Fibonacci levels. And again, you're looking for bearish price action to enter a short trade. And here's the graphical example. This is a bounce back up to the 50% retracement level. So the market breaks down in an impulsive fashion. Bases out, starts to trend a little bit higher, but we're looking to sell it. It goes through the 38.2% level. It hits the 50% retracement level. We see signs of renewed supply. In other words, perhaps a little double top here on the charts. And then we take a stab at the short side, looking for a retest of the low and maybe the swing lower um, for the repeat of this kind of swing down. Okay, so let's see a few examples um, on some price charts just to see how this, um, this uh, retracement concept can work. So in this case, we see a market that uh, makes a swing high, starts to trend lower, finds a swing low, makes a base, bounces up to the 38.2% retracement level, forms a bullish reversal bar. Um, the green uh, circle is kind of where the, the market uh, tops out, marginally breaks above the 38.2% and forms this reversal bar and then swings lower. Again, we see the market make a swing low here, bounces up quite aggressively for a couple of days, but it tops out at the 38.2% retracement of this swing. Actually, what I'm doing here on this particular swing here is I'm using the same swing high, 114.484, looks like dollar yen, uh, and the, the low for the swing in both occasions. So we can actually take um, stabs at the market um, from using the same swing high, but using different swing lows. In fact, the, the, uh, the third example here also uses the same swing high, 114.484. It makes a new swing low and again, tops out, hits the 38.2% retracement, forms a bullish reversal bar and gets ready for another swing to the downside. Okay, next example. This one is actually a chart of euro dollar, a daily chart of euro dollar. And the market bases out, starts to trend higher uh, from swing low of 105.691, makes a swing high 110.184. And then we see a nice uh, four day pullback on, on euro dollar uh, into this kind of circle uh, here. Um, it pulls back to the 61.8, which is also the 38.2 turned upside down. Um, and bases out there, and then the market breaks higher, forms a bullish um, thrust pattern where it closes above the previous bar's high, and that tells you that we've got signs of renewed demand coming in after the pullback, the correction uh, of this swing. So the market, so swing low to swing high, pulls back to the 38.2% retracement level, and then sees signs of demand. Buy into it, stop under corrective low, looking for new highs, retest of the high, and possibly new highs, which we saw. So then the market um, pulls back a bit, comes back, makes a new high, forms a swing high, and again, corrects lower, and hits the, the 38.2 or the 61.8 in reverse, hits it, there's the uh, the blue circle to tell you where the, uh, the low was, then it breaks higher, starts to trend a little bit higher, and then you've got yourself entry into this long, uh, this uptrend after a nice, healthy, corrective pullback to the Fibonacci um, retracement level. Another example, this is uh, what looks like um, Australian dollar. Uh, market breaks down aggressively, forms a swing low around the 60 level, and then starts to base out and trend higher. So break, we see a nice uptrend up to the swing high, 62.07, and then we start to correct lower. So now we're looking for a pullback, a correction of this swing low to swing high. It breaks through that first Fibonacci level, which it usually does. Um, and then it comes back down towards the 61.8, which is also the 38.2, just flipped upside down. Um, first stab at it, doesn't quite make it. Then a little bit of sideways action, breaks through it marginally, but can't close below it. 
then we start to see this base pattern here and that's an opportunity to get long you've had a swing to the upside a pull back to the downside which bases just below the 61.8 percent retracement level good entry into this uh, this upswing looking for a retest of the high and most likely new highs which we see okay so that's retracement levels fibonacci retracement levels so Fibonacci is also important for projection levels. Um, if you saw my, uh, my, my, um, my webinar on price patterns um, and uh, targets that come from that measured move targets, um, I may have mentioned Fibonacci uh, during that, uh, that section. Well, certainly Fibonacci um, analysts, traders will, will use Fibonacci extensions to, um, to define price targets based on uh, market swings. So what we're looking for is to identify the start of an impulsive move, uh, either up or down. So I call that point zero to point one. Then we identify a correction, point one to point two. And once we've nailed the end of point two, in other words, the end of the correction to the first swing, then we're looking for, um, we're looking to pinpoint targets for the next swing, assuming that we replicate the first swing to a certain degree. And what we're doing is we're looking at, we're using Fibonacci ratios of that first swing uh, added to the low of the correction for an up uh, swing target. So we're looking for uh, distances added to point two to generate upside targets for swing two to three. Let's see the graphical example first. So point zero is the start of the upswing. So the market swings higher in an impulsive fashion. That's point one. So we've gone from point zero to point one. That's your impulsive swing to the upside. So once we get into correction mode, uh, we're looking for the market to correct lower, typically to around the 38%, 0.2%, maybe the 50% retracement, we have to see. And once we are pretty confident that the market has based out in this, uh, this one to two move, that's when we can start to look for projections to the upside based on uh, the move from point zero to point one projected up from the point two low. So once we've seen the, the what we think is the point two low, we're adding um, distance zero to one uh, multiplied by 0 0.618, 1, uh, 1 1.0, 1 1.382 and 1 1.618. So that gives us the kind of potential uh, targets for the swing two to swing to point three, point two to point three. On the short side, um, again, what we're looking to do is identify an impulsive swing lower, point one to point, uh, point zero to point one down. And then once we, uh, we've seen the end of the impulsive swing, we're looking for the correction higher, typically into that 38.2, maybe 50% retracement uh, area. And once we've seen that, and we, we're happy that we think we've seen um, the move from point one to point two top out, we're then looking for um, a breakdown in swing two to swing, uh, point two to point three. We, we're looking for Fibonacci uh, ratios of the initial swing down zero to one from point two. Better, better to see the, uh, the chart um, to help explain that one better, I think. So from point zero to point one, that's your impulsive swing to the downside. That gives you your bias to the downside. But you want to sell this market once you've seen the correction. That's the whole point. We want to see the swing to the downside, the correction to the upside, and then we want to get into the downside looking for the, the break either to, to retest the low where we'll probably take some profits and move the stock down, but ideally to these Fibonacci um, projection levels of the initial swing. So the distance uh, zero to one projected from point two once we're happy that we've seen the end of this correction. And that gives us the targets to the downside. OK, so let's see a few examples of um, Fibonacci projections. So first example here, the market uh, tops out, which is this is our point zero. And the swing to the downside is point is uh, zero to one. That's our bearish swing. So once we've seen the completion of this bearish swing and the market starts to correct higher, we're waiting for a nice pullback, which uh, this this one does. So it goes from, uh, it looks like just below one, uh, 119 or so up to 127 and a half. 
then it starts to top out. So now we've seen the swing to the downside, the correction, one to two, and now we're looking for the breakdown to, um, uh, to, to at least retest the low, which we saw, but ideally to these Fibonacci projection levels. Now, the first one comes in at 0.618 times this initial swing. So zero to one times 0.618, subtracted from the end of point or the start of point two. And that comes in right here where the market uh, finds its initial base, retests and finds a lot of support down here. So that's not a bad um, target for the swing uh, zero to one projected from point two. Next example, uh, the market um, initially starts off here, swings higher to point one, then it corrects down um, in a nice, a nice correction of this swing. Once we start to break higher, we're pretty sure that the market has seen its correction or its swing, impulsive swing, its correction, and now we start to break higher. So once we start to break higher, initially we're looking for a retest of the high, which we see pretty quickly, but then we're looking for Fibonacci uh, extensions of this move from zero to one projected from point two. So, so the distance zero to one projected from point two, which is 119.15. And that gives you a couple of targets up here. The, the one for one target, which is the typical measured move target that we get within basic technical analysis, uh, that comes in there, 122.86, where the market stalled. Uh, we saw it uh, stall for a few days. And then when the market breaks again, it breaks straight through the 1.382, but it hits the 1.618, where it really finds some stiff resistance on the first attempt has a retest and can't break through it on a closing basis. And then we see a big move down. So the one for one and the 1.618 um, um, extension levels, they um, provided pretty stiff resistance for, uh, I think it's Euro, it is Euro dollar on this particular swing higher. Another example here, this one, uh, the market breaks down quite sharply, corrects higher. And then we start to see the market break down again. We've got actually two swings here. So we've got a red swing, which is uh, this one zero to one, then it corrects back up. And then the market breaks down to the 1.382% uh, or the 1.382 times projection level. And also we've got this black swing here, which, is, which uses the same point zero. There's your point one, there's your point two. And then when the market breaks down, it bases out at this 0.618 um, projection level based on the swing zero to one projected from point two. So you've got a couple of um, different um, uh, swings uh, in, in, in play there, both of which use the same, um, the same swing high. Okay, so there is um, another way I, I like to use the Fibonacci extensions, perhaps um, much less common than the standard way, and that is to, I call them a type two extension. So instead of measuring from the uh, end of the correction, what you're doing is measuring from the end of the impulsive wave. So you're measuring from point one and not point two. So you can actually use these type two extensions in conjunction with the type one typical uh, textbook type extensions. So for upside targets, what we'd like, what we want to do is number one, identify our bull impulsive bull swing, which is the same as before, 0.0 to 0.1. And then we calculate our Fibonacci uh, ratios of 0.0 to 0.1, as we did with the normal example. But instead of waiting for the correction to unfold and then add these numbers to the end of point two, in other words, the corrective low, we're adding these to the end of the impulsive swing higher, in other words, point one. And that gives us a whole different set of uh, projection targets. So if we get a confluence of um, targets uh, which match those, some of which could match these, um, the typical ones, then we've got stronger levels to shoot for. Let's take a look at how, um, how this works on the graphical representation. So for a bull swing, a bull swing, we're looking for upside targets. So 0.0 to 0.1, that gives us our impulsive wave. Now, previously what we did for the type one, the normal uh, example is we're waiting for the correction to 0.2, 
to then identify the swing zero to one multiplied by Fibonacci levels to give you the, uh, the projection targets from point two. But what we're doing in this case is we're saying, okay, zero to one, that's the impulsive swing. Multiply that by your Fibonacci uh, ratios and then add it not to point two, which is down there, but you're adding them to point one, which is here. So that gives you three um, or more different um, targets to shoot for. And here's the bearish example. The market swings lower from point zero to point one. Then we get the correction higher. But what we're doing, in addition to, to, to um, uh, our Fibonacci calculation zero to one, in, in addition to uh, uh, at, subtracting them from point two, which is here, we're also subtracting them from point one, which is here. So that will give us a different set of Fibonacci um, targets to shoot for, uh, which you can use in conjunction with the typical ones, which we'll see uh, from point two. Okay, so just a few examples here of the, um, the other method, the type two method. So point zero to point one multiplied by the Fibonacci uh, retracement uh, levels, and we subtract them from the point one low. And in this particular swing, the market goes through the 382, but it bases out at the 618 right there. So then the market bases out at the point 618 of the zero to one swing, uh, forms a double bottom kind of thing, and then starts to trend higher. Then we get this zero to one upswing. Market corrects lower, 0.1 to 0.2. And what we're doing here is we're adding the zero to one swing, multiply that by Fibonacci um, um, levels, and we are getting the 382 comes in there for the 0.3, and that's where the market tops out. So in this case, the 0.382 of the initial swing formed pretty stiff resistance and a good target to shoot for on the way up. Uh, this example, the market basis out here forms a, um, a, 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 a zero. The market swings higher to point one, so you've got a zero to one swing higher. Then the market corrects lower in uh, a, a, a number two to the downside. And then we have our target zero to one multiplied by the Fibonacci ratios. And that gives us a 0 0.382 there and a 0 0.618 there, which actually nailed the high for the upswing. So this is quite, um, it can be quite, quite good because you know in advance where the market has a good chance um, of topping out. So assuming that you get into the market and you take maybe some profits at the swing high and you could take some more profits at the uh, 382 and maybe close the whole position out at the 1.618. So you've got upside targets to, um, you know, to, to, to shoot for when the market swings higher, corrects lower and starts to go higher again in a continuation of the larger trend. Another example. So the market base is out here. Looks like just below 120. Market swings higher. Uh, so we get a, quite a nice impulsive swing to the upside. Then we start to see this deep correction to the downside, which bases out... Um, where is it? Uh, not too far from the six, actually there's the, uh, the, the 61.8 because it's between the 50 and the 33. So it bases pretty close to the Fibonacci 61.8 retracement, nice classic, classic second wave action, and then starts to, to rally quite aggressively higher. So what we've got using this second, uh, this type two method, zero to one, that's your impulsive swing. Add the Fibonacci ratios to the, of the zero one swing, to the swing one, uh, the the, uh, the one higher, you've got the 382 there, there's 61.8 there, and that pretty much nails the top of the impulsive swing two to three. Okay, so that concludes the Fibonacci extension um, uh, topic. Now um, I want to talk a little bit about Fibonacci time cycles because that's something perhaps a little bit uh, bit more arcane, perhaps not as um, as common uh, to use with Fibonacci than um, retracements and projections. But uh, it's worth, worth mentioning because there are a lot of people that like to um, use cycle analysis and uh, use Fibonacci uh, projection time time projections to look for turning points in the markets. So. Some people believe that um, cycles are the driving force of financial markets because markets do um, have a cyclical nature to them. 
So the theory is that um, markets, they form important highs and important lows, and that markets in the future should turn a certain number of bars or days or weeks, depending on what chart you're looking at, from important highs and lows on the charts. And Fibonacci um, numbers are used uh, for this particular uh, method of forecasting financial markets. So Fibonacci time cycles are used to an anticipate a likely turning point in the market. So what you'll find is, um, is, is analysts and traders, they'll be looking at Fibonacci anniversary dates of important swing highs and swing lows. So what, um, what you'll be doing is you'll identify on the chart um, an important swing high or swing low, and you'll, you'll call that bar, your bar zero. And from bar zero, you'll be counting numbers, Fibonacci numbers into the future to generate likely uh, or potential turning points for the, uh, the market to turn around. So from bar zero, you'll be adding the Fibonacci number sequence, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, et cetera, et cetera, into the future. Now, what you'll get is you'll, you'll start to see, as you use more than one bar zero, more than one turning point in the market, you'll start to see a confluence of Fibonacci um, dates, which will give you an idea where the market is likely to, to turn. So should you see maybe two or three um, uh, Fibonacci uh, projections into the future around roughly around the same, uh, the same date, then that could give you some, some added confidence that the market is likely to turn around that date. Okay, so this is just the, um, the graphical uh, representation of the idea. So the market, um, it, uh, it forms a very important low, swings down, bounces aggressively, forms a very important low, and we call that bar zero. So from your bar zero, you're adding Fibonacci um, dates into the future. So plus three days, plus five days, plus eight days, plus 13 days, 21 days, 34 days, et cetera, et cetera, into the future. And then once you get towards these dates, that's when you're starting to look for your uh, your turn in trend. So if you've got the, um, the the time sequence right, and you're and and you start to see something on the charts which gives you um, some some confidence that the market is doing a turn, then you can be ahead of the game uh, in terms of anticipating a big move to the downside. Okay. So that, um, that pretty much wraps up the Fibonacci section. So we've covered uh, retracements, we've covered projections, and we've covered uh, time projections as well. So now the second half of this, um, this presentation is, um, is about Elliott Wave analysis, which to a large degree uh, owes a lot to, to the Fibonacci uh, sequence um, and ratios. It leans on, uh, on Fibonacci to a large, um, to a large extent. Okay, so the Elliott Wave principle was developed by a guy called Ralph Nelson Elliott in the 1930s. And uh, he, um, he basically discovered and um, postulated that stock prices trend and correct in recognizable patterns or waves. So the theory, as with, with basic technical analysis, is that mass psychology drives the markets and mass psychology creates patterns in the markets. But uh, the patterns that you'll see in the, um, the Elliott identified are somewhat different from, to a large degree, somewhat different to the patterns that, uh, that we, um, that classic technical uh, analysts use to identify uh, market uh, corrections and um, uh, use to project market, uh, market moves into the future. So, the idea is that changes in market psychology in a predictable and repeatable way that we can use for forecasting the market. So Elliott Wave obviously has forecasting value if we can locate where we are within the current Elliott Wave cycle. But as with most um, uh, methods of technical analysis, Elliott Wave in particular, I would say, can be a little bit challenging <clears throat> because uh, it's something which you have to identify in real time. And uh, real time analysis uh, using Elliott Wave can be a little bit challenging because um, predicting the market uh, can, can be a little bit tough because there are lots of 
lots of curveballs that can come in, which can change the, uh, the Elliott Wave count. And you'll find that most Elliott Wave um, practitioners will have alternative counts because it's no, no one count is going, to be, um, is going to be set in stone. So it's all about probabilities, as is, the, um, as is most um, aspects of, uh, of market forecasting. <clears throat> so each, um, each Elliott Wave um, uh, analyst will probably have a different wave count to, to the other, <clears throat> and um, it will be based on probabilities as they see them. So the Elliott Wave cycle is really, um, it's based upon this two-step cycle consisting of what, what is known as an impulse wave and a corrective wave. A little bit like I was talking about um, Fibonacci projections and extensions when, when talking about in, impulse and correction. What we're talking about is the impulse move being in the direction of the larger trend and a corrective move to being against the larger trend. So impulsive waves go in the, in the direction of the, of the trend of the larger degree, whereas corrective waves go against the trend of the larger degree. Now, with Elliott wave, we're going to be talking about sequences of five waves in the direction of the trend and three waves most of the time against the trend. So the impulsive waves break down into five smaller waves, which are the numbered sequence. So you'll see when you're doing Elliott wave counts, you'll see numbers and letters on the charts. The numbered sequences are the impulsive waves, which tell you the direction of the trend. And you're looking for the corrections against the trend, the letter phases, looking for the corrections, the ABCs against the trend to give you an idea as to where to get in um, in um, in terms of the next swing higher. There is an exception, as, uh, as there are in most, uh, most forms of, uh, of, an, of technical analysis and an analysis in general. The exception to this 5-3 um, sequence is there are triangles which break down into five wave patterns, so A, B, C, D, E, but these triangles are typically, five, uh, are typically three wave sequences. So you'll get three up, three down, three up, three down, three up, three down, um, and then you get a resumption of the trend. Okay, so once the Elliott cycle has completed, then you'll get the next impulsive move within the, um, the trend of the next uh, higher degree. Okay, so let's take a look at how the Elliott wave sequence unfolds. Okay, so what you've got, this is um, an up sequence, an up cycle. So what you'll have is an impulsive wave to the upside, and then you'll, you'll get a corrective move to the downside, which corrects the old impulsive move, and then you'll get the next impulsive wave to the upside. So each impulsive wave breaks down into five to the upside. So one, two, three, four, and five. And then if you look closer at the corrective wave, that will typically break down into three waves, A, B, and C. That's the lettered sequence. So the numbered sequence is the impulsive sequence to the upside. That gives you the direction of the trend. And then the correction is A, B, and C. So what you're looking for from a, um, a trading perspective is you're looking to identify a five-wave move to the upside, followed by a three-wave move to the downside, looking to buy. And once you're confident that you've seen the end of wave C of this A, B, C down, that tells you that you should be in the next um, upswing of the larger degree. So you're looking for, once you've seen the end of this ABC to the downside, you're looking for another five wave sequence to the upside, which will take you through this swing high. So five up, three down, time to buy, get in for the next move up. Okay, so as I say, Elliott wave, um, impulsive wave break down into sequences of five waves of the lesser degree. And corrective waves break down into three waves of the lesser degree. Now, I mentioned before that Fibonacci, to a large degree, features within the Elliott wave um, uh, sequence and is used to a large degree by Elliott wave practitioners. Well, just as a um, as a bit of a, an aside, um, five is a, a Fibonacci number, five waves up. Three is a Fibonacci number, three waves down. A complete Elliott wave cycle, five waves up to the upside three waves to the downside for an up cycle, that's eight waves of the lesser degree, another, another Fibonacci number. 
A complete five wave cycle of the lesser degree is uh, comes to 21 waves. That's also a Fibonacci number. So five up, three down, five up, three down, five up. Add these numbers together is 21. So that is another Fibonacci number. And then a three wave correction of that 21 uh, wave sequence to the upside. That typically, if that comes into a, a 535 situation, a zigzag, which I'll talk about later, that will give you 13 sub waves to the downside. Another Fibonacci number at 21 plus 13, that gives you 34, another Fibonacci number. So what we're seeing to a large degree is Fibonacci numbers um, totaling the number of impulsive and corrective waves. OK, so here's the, um, the graphical representation of, of what I just talked about. So um, an up cycle, one, two, three, four, five. That's five waves up. One, two, three, that's your ABC down. That's five, six, seven, eight. Another five up, another three down, another five up. There's 21 waves to the upside. That's a Fibonacci number. And then assuming that we see a, a five, three, five down, a zigzag, then that's 13 down. So Fibonacci number 21, Fibonacci number 13. 21 plus 13 is 34, a 34 wave cycle. Okay. Okay. So now, um, having just given you the basic intro to Elliott Wave, now let's, let's just go through a few of the rules of Elliott Wave. If you're going to use it, it's good to know what the rules are. And Elliott does have some unbreakable rules, which um, if you're using Elliott Wave analysis, you should, uh, you should adhere to. If you're doing something different to this, then you are not doing Elliott Wave theory. You're doing something else. Okay, the first unbreakable rule is that Wave 2 cannot go below, beyond the start of wave one. So assuming an up sequence, this is the start of wave one, the market swings higher in wave one, wave two corrects wave one. So by correcting wave one, we can't go beyond the start of wave one, because if we, if we, if we go beyond the start of wave one, we're not correcting it, we're actually starting a new move to the downside. So wave two is correcting wave one, so it cannot go below the start of wave one. Okay, so you swing higher in wave one, you correct lower in wave two, and then you base out, and then you go higher in wave three, which takes out the top of wave one. Okay, so that's the first unbreakable rule of the Elliott sequence. Okay. The next, uh, ne the next rule is that wave three is never the shortest wave within an Elliott wave five wave sequence. So an impulsive wave is one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. But wave three is never the shortest wave within this sequence. So big wave one correction there, small, smaller wave three, wave four correction, larger wave five. This is not a typical Elliott move. This will tell you most likely that this move two to three, which you've labeled as wave three, is most likely the start, waves one and waves two, of a larger wave three pattern. So one, two, one, two, three, four, five for wave three, four, and then five again. Okay, so if you see a very short wave three, it gives you a clue that wave three is, is what they say, what they call subdividing. In other words, wave three, uh, wave three is extending, which is the most, um, the most common uh, aspect within uh, financial market moves. Wave three is usually the longest and strongest part of a move because that's when people realize that the market really is in an up, uptrend. Okay, and the third, um, the third unbreakable rule is that um, when I say unbreakable, this this one's perhaps a little bit um, uh, a bit floaty in, in that respect because there are um, uh, exceptions to the rule. But first things first, let's assume that we are in a typical five wave sequence. The market goes one, wave two corrects wave one, wave three breaks through the top of wave one, longest and strongest, if not certainly not the shortest, corrects lower. Wave four does not go below the start of wave one. Okay. So one, two, three, four, four corrects wave three and does not overlap the top of wave one before basing out and seeing wave five. So you've got a five wave sequence where two doesn't go below the start of one, four doesn't go below the end of wave one. 
and then you get wave five. At the end of wave five, that then it's time to correct lower. Okay. Now, just to go through the um, uh, the exceptions to the rule, if it's a leading or an ending triangle, these are kind of more more complex patterns that um, that we see within the Elliott sequence where we get an overlapping uh, wave one or wave A or wave C or wave five. But these, these are kind of more com complex structures which will be covered at a later date with perhaps a bit more advanced Elliott, um, uh, Elliott wave patterns. So that's your kind of exception to the rule. But most of the time, what you're looking for is wave four does not go be be beyond the end of wave one. No overlap between four and one. Okay, now I'm going to show you a few um, corrective patterns. So we've talked about impulsive sequences now. Now we're talking about the corrective patterns. These are the things that you're looking to identify um, the end of before taking a trade, uh, looking for a resumption of the previous swing. So in this case, market swings higher and then it corrects in what is known as a zigzag. Now a zigzag pattern is a five down, three up, followed by five down pattern, A, B, C. So the first leg of a zigzag breaks down into five waves. So this is an impulsive wave to the downside uh, within a three-legged sequence. So five down, the three-wave bounce, which is wave B, corrects wave A down. And then when once wave B tops out, we get a five-wave sequence down to complete wave C, which goes below the bottom of wave A. So A, B, and C. Now, oftentimes we'll find that wave C is linked uh, to wave A or resembles wave A uh, by a Fibonacci number. So in other words, projection down A from the top of wave B to nail the bottom of wave C. Oftentimes you'll get one for one, 1 1.618 for one, 0.618 for one, A, B, and C. But wave C within a zigzag breaks through the bottom of wave A. And it breaks down, the, the C leg breaks down into five waves. So five down, three up, five down, once it bases out, that's when you're looking to take a stab at the long side in this particular example. So that's a, a zigzag. Now, there's also a flat pattern, which is basically that breaks down into three down, three up, and then five down. So unlike the zigzag, which is five down, three up, five down, this is three down, three up, and five down. Now, the flat is much more of a sideways correction rather than a deep correction, which is, what the, which is the zigzag. Um, so the market essentially goes, it goes into a range. You get a three-wave move down, a bounce back up, which sometimes it will make a new high. Sometimes it will stall below the high. Um, there are different variants on the flat. There's an expanded or a regular flat, which makes a new high. Um, and the C leg typically will come down, perhaps make a slight new low, uh, or base out close to the A leg low. If it's a running correction, um, C will base out above the top of wave A if it's a very strong move that precedes it. So as I say, there are variants on the pattern, but what you're looking for is strong move up, impulsive move up, which tells you which way the trend is, three down, three up, and then five down to complete the move. And once you've seen the end of this C leg, then you assume that the market is doing this again, is ready to swing higher, in the next impulsive sequence to the upside, which will take you to new highs. Okay, now here's that exception I mentioned before um, of corrective waves breaking down, not into um, uh, three-legged sequences, but five-legged sequences. So this is your triangle, A, B, C, D, E. So it's a five-wave pattern, but the crucial part of this is that each of the legs within the triangle breaks down into three waves. So in other words, corrective move down, corrective move up, corrective move down, corrective move up, and corrective move down there for the E leg. So A, B, C, D, E. And then once we've completed the E leg of the triangle, that's when the market moves up, and that's when we take a stab at the long side in this particular example. Now, triangles are usually seen in uh, the position wave four or wave B within a, um, a, a with an ABC correction. So this would typically be wave three, 
A, B, C, D, E, four. And then you're looking for a wave five thrust out of the triangle to complete the sequence, a five wave sequence. Or if it's an A, B, C move, this would be swing higher for A, A, B, C, D, E for B, and then a swing higher for wave C, and that completes A, B, C to the upside. Then you're looking for a big move to the downside. So it depends where you are within the larger cycle. Okay. So within each five wave, this, this, is the, uh, this is known as the rule of alternation. So basically within each five wave sequence, the, each of the corrective moves, so in other words, wave two and wave four, they are usually very different. So if wave one, uh, sorry, if wave two is a deep correction and is a zigzag, in other words, five down, three up, five down again, basis out in wave three, then typically wave four will alternate in terms of uh, its type of correction. So if wave two was a zigzag, wave four was most likely going to be a triangle and not retrace too much of wave three. If wave two was a deep correction, wave four will be a shallow correction. That's the, that's the idea about the rule of alternation. So each correction has a different nature to the other correction within the same sequence. So one, two, three, four, five, deep correction, zigzag in wave two, shallow correction, time-based correction, triangle correction in wave four. Okay, so with um, regards to impulsive waves, they, in some respects, uh, they, they, they lend something from basic technical analysis where they move within the confines of a trend channel. So what you'll find very often times is when the market makes a five wave sequence to the upside, for example, if you do a parallel channel connecting wave two and wave four projected from the top of wave three, most of the time, um, you will nail or you'll find the idea, the ideal location for the top of wave five. So once you've seen wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four correction, and we go higher, we start to think, okay, where is wave five going? We're looking for the, the location of the top of wave five. Now, obviously, we've got Fibonacci projections based on wave one and wave three, which we can uh, pin to the bottom of wave four, and also to the top of wave three using the type two method. Um, and that will give us a confluence of potential targets for wave five. But then we've also got this channel return line, which comes in um, towards the, the uh, projected from, from the top of wave three. And that gives us another place where we can look for the end of this particular swing. So that's where we're going to be looking to take profits and maybe taking a stab at the short side. OK, so now we'll take a look at a few examples of, um, of the Elliott wave um, sequence in action. Uh, this, is, um, this, is, this is actually a chart of crude oil futures. Just to show you, there's a nice five wave sequence to the downside. So one, wave two, this is wave three. Wave three breaks down into one, two, three, four, five. So the idea is that um, with Elliott wave um, um, sequences, there's, there are fractals at work. So if you, if you examine each of these subwaves under the microscope and you look at them on a smaller time frame chart, you will see that they break down the impulsive waves, wave one, wave three, and wave five. They'll break down into five wave sequences. And the corrective moves will break down into three wave sequences. So one, two, three, four, five for wave one, ABC for wave two, one, two, three, four, five for wave three, ABC for wave four, and then the breakdown in, in wave five. So one, two, three, four, five. And at the bottom, that's when we start to break higher. That tells you that we're in a, a new swing to the upside. Uh, another example here, this is actually cable, a daily chart of cable uh, going into the UK general election last year. One, two, three, four. See, wave four does not overlap the top of wave one. Wave two doesn't overlap the bottom of, of these, the start of wave one. And then we base out. This is the shallow base correction. And then we rally in wave five. And that's the top uh, amid the UK election result. And that's the end of the sequence and we've not been higher since. In fact, we've been much lower. Okay, um, this is an example of, I think it's NASDAQ. This is an example of an Elliott wave triangle pattern. 
So what we've got here is the top of the previous impulsive swing of wave three. And then we go ABC down for wave A, up in wave B, actually makes a new high, but a very choppy wave B, um, B leg move to a new high. Then we break down in wave C, the C leg. Then we get a three wave move up to D, which doesn't break through the top of the, the B leg, which is normal triangle action. Then we come down in a very choppy E leg move to the downside, which again, bases out at a higher point than point C. So you go A, B, C, D, E. That's the end of the triangle, wave four. And then we start to base higher and we start to look for a big thrust into new highs, which we get. So if you can identify a triangle pattern after a nice thrust to the upside, which looks like a wave three or a wave A, then you have yourself a nice um, uh, wave C or wave three uh, projection to the upside once you're confident that the E leg of the triangle has finished. Okay, um, this is just an example to show you how looking for ABC movements against the trend can be quite a good strategy uh, if you're using Elliott. Because the thing about Elliott Wave, as I mentioned before, is it's very difficult to apply in real time, knowing exactly where you are within a cycle, um, because counting all of the sub waves by looking at sh shorter term charts can be very difficult. There are lots of recounts and it can be very, very difficult to apply in real time. But I think the key aspect of using Elliott is to identify something as strong um, as a five wave move or a three wave ABC move. So if you can identify the end of a five wave cycle, then you know you're looking for at least a three wave move to the upside, maybe a new five wave move to the upside, depending on the larger degree trend. But perhaps more powerful is to locate an ABC correction, a three wave move against the trend. So what you're doing is you're saying, OK, I've identified a five wave sequence to the downside in this case. Now I'm waiting for an ABC to the upside, which is this A, B and C. And once you fail above the top of the A leg high, you start to break down. You've got yourself a pretty good um, uh, idea analysis that the market should at least retest, make a new low because you're looking for a resumption of the, the, uh, the larger trend, which is down because we've got a five wave move to the downside, an impulsive move, followed by a three wave impulsive move to the upside. Same again here, the market makes a swing low, the low point for the trend, breaks higher, comes back down, A and B, breaks higher again, and instead of blasting higher in a new five wave sequence to the upside, what it does is it reverses pretty sharply, and at this point you're pretty sure that the market has done an ABC against the trend. Now you're looking for new swing lows, which you see pretty quickly. Okay, so using Elliott Wave, even if you are not a pure Elliottitian and you're looking to figure out every single uh, wiggle and waggle of the market, if you can identify some of these patterns, ABC patterns, an ABC pattern against the trend is a good pattern to identify because you're going with the trend. You're looking for the end of a correction um, within a trend. And once you've located the end of an ABC pattern, then you can start to put in your projection targets for the, um, for the, for the next leg of the trend. Okay, another example here. Uh, this is um, an ABC move against the trend. So the markets, it's, um, it's basically chopping up, chopping down, and then we get this big move, big swing higher, then this correction lower in the B leg. Then we start to break higher, one, two, three, four, five in, in wave C. Now we had this overlap in, in the, the, the one, two, three, four, which I mentioned before, if we get an overlap in a five wave sequence, it tells you that we are either in a leading diagonal or an ending diagonal. Now our ending diagonals occur in wave five or wave C, and they basically end a larger sequence, A, B, and C. So what we had here was a, 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 an A up to, to the upside, a B to the downside, a zigzag, one, two, three, four, and five, overlap here. So that's your diagonal ending C leg, um, ending triangle. We break down impulsively there, one, two, and then we're back into this move, one, two, three, four, five, down. So A, B, and C, 
identifying the end of this um, this this correct corrective move the market bounces up in a correction so we're looking for a big push down which we get okay so i think uh, just just summing up the um the elliott wave um, experience and methodology the best way to use um, elliott wave i would say is on, on an opportunist level is not to uh, try and forecast every single move uh, but if you identify a pattern for example an ABC to use it so if you're that's that's if you're trading on a discretionary basis so you're looking to identify patterns as you do with basic technical analysis um, if you see an ABC pattern against a five wave sequence or you see a five wave sequence and you've got momentum divergences and other supporting factors then you've got yourself um, a piece of analysis which you can use um, against the trend or, or, or basically you're looking to, um, to trade in the direction of the swing, uh, impulsive swing, correction against it, then you go with the swing. So as I say, it's good in conjunction with other tools. For example, um, an, ABD, an ABC decline uh, with an, uh, a bullish divergence in the C leg that gives you a bit of added weight, a bit of added evidence that the um, the market is ready to go higher. Uh, but obviously, as with um, all, all aspects of technical analysis, the key is to determine the path of least resistance. Um, and you can do that by identifying something like a five wave move or an ABC move. OK, so let's um, flip across the MetaTrader just for a quick look at some of the um, some of these markets. Let me just sh share my screen. Okay. Okay. So first, um, first thing I want to mention is uh, is cable sterling dollar. So what we've had with um, with cable sterling dollar is we've had um, a, a move in Elliott terms. We've had uh, a wave one down, a two up, and then you've got one, two, three, four, five. So you've got kind of like a one, two, and a three. There's no overlap at this point between wave two and wave one, and then we've broken down here. Not in a, um, a five wave sequence. So this to me looks like we've had one, two, three, A, A, B, C for B. And now we're kind of chopping higher in a C leg, um, a, C, a, a C leg rally. So this looks to be like a, one of those um, bear market corrections where perhaps we'll see one more push higher within the C leg of the pattern, uh, the um, uh, perhaps a running correction where we go A, B, and then C, which perhaps tops out around there. And then we break down to, to new lows to complete the sequence. With gold, gold, all I can see with gold is we've had um, an impulsive sequence to the upside, a corrective sequence to the downside, and now we're breaking higher in some third wave, which should eventually take us through um, to new all-time highs, I would say, for gold. So impulsive swing to the upside, corrective swing to the downside then we've got one two or one abc for two so this i think from now on we get pullbacks they're going to be very shallow very limited we should be breaking through this um uh, this swing high at some point um obviously where will it go wrong obviously we need to come back to make the overlap through the top of this wave one high here but i think that's a very unlikely um scenario uh flipping across to the s p 500 now, S&P 500, this is interesting because obviously we've had um, quite a big, uh, just waiting for the update here, we've had, taking a little bit of time, there you go. So what we've had here is we've had this kind of, um, it looks like we've, we, we've had a kind of a, a, a B wave move to the upside. So we've had like three down, three up, and then a kind of a, a big move to the downside, but we've retraced a very large portion of the of the move down. So looking at it on a bit more of a shorter term scale, the question would be, um, is the move up a corrective move or is it going to be a move which takes us up to new highs? Let's just wait for this to come through. So what we've got here is we've got a one, two, three, four, five. So we have kind of a wave one or a wave A. And then we get this three, three, five move to the downside, a pullback to the downside. So that is a correction of the first swing higher. So that's one, two, or B. So 
like that. So A, B, or one, two, and then we get this move to the upside, okay? Now what we've got is a marginal overlap between the top of wave one and uh, the bottom of, if this is wave four within the sequence. So this is a bit of a warning, a bit of a warning that this could possibly be A, B, C. But the thing is the price action over the last week or two, ideally what one would, would have liked to have seen the market break down through this low at this point here. So this market is a lot stronger than um, than it perhaps should be if this is a kind of a one, uh, um, if this is a kind of A, B, C, one, two breakdown in wave three. So my suspicion is that this is a kind of a one, two, maybe this is one, two of a larger wave three to the upside, an extended third wave. So that would be my, uh, my best interpretation, I think, using Elliott wave at this stage. So my bias would be to the upside. Obviously, if we, if we crack through some of these lows here, then we are talking about we've seen A, B and C, and then we're looking for a pullback and a retest of the panic lows. But uh, right now, that would not be my favorite scenario. Um, it looks like a risk on situation to me. Uh, Euro dollar. Euro dollar to me looks to be um, just looking at the, uh, the daily chart here. This looks like a panic low that we've seen here. We've had an impulsive swing to the upside, call that wave one or wave eight. Then we've seen this ABC to the downside. So one, two, and now we're breaking high what looks like within wave three. So one, two, three, this looks like perhaps a fourth wave within this larger wave three. So we should be seeing a retest of this swing high um, at some point. This, this to me looks like um, it may well be completion of um, a triangle pattern or make, making a triangle pattern before we break higher in wave five of this three. So one, two, and then this looks like wave three or wave C. But bigger picture wise, I would say um, we, we are stuck in a bit of a range. My bias is, is actually to the upside for, um, for Euro dollar because um, dollar index wise looks like it's breaking down um, in a major, major downtrend for the US dollar. So my bias for, on Euro dollar would certainly be to the upside uh, looking for um, a push higher. Once we get above one uh, one fifteen, I think we're off to off to the races on this one. Okay, so that pretty much um, concludes uh, today's presentation. Um, thank you. Let me just uh, flip back across to the main screen. Okay, just flip across to the main screen. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, for um, for coming, for attending, um, and um, I'd like to uh, open up the floor for uh, for any any questions that you may have. Let me just turn off the uh, off the video for now. Okay, hi, hi Srila, thank you. Uh, yeah, please, please go, go ahead with your question. The best time period for Elliott waves, in my experience. Okay, um, I would say the uh, the daily chart is probably the best one because on the intraday charts, you're gonna get a lot more noise. And I think it's a lot more subject to, um, to recounts. Um, that having been said, um, I think as, as, as I mentioned, in the ideal world, what we're looking to do is identify um, ABC patterns, for example. So if you can see ABC patterns, then um, the, the, the shorter term charts also are quite good. So, um, so, so, so daily charts to, to give you strong forecasts, I would say, uh, if you're looking to make a big forecast, but um, daily charts and intraday charts, if you're looking to identify uh, ABC patterns. Okay, any more questions? Um, hi, Carl. So um, in, a, in a more typical way, well, Elliott Wave is really about mass psychology, as, as is most uh, market analysis. But um, 
the, the markets which have got the most participation, for example, euro dollar, um, the stock indices, which have got mass uh, participation, these are the ones which will be much more prone to, um, to, you know, to, to using Elliott wave analysis. So the, the bigger the participation of the market, I'd, I'd say the much more likely it is to, to follow um, Elliott wave uh, patterns. But either way, at the end of the day, what, what we're looking to do is identify trend and correction. So even in markets which are perhaps not quite as um, uh, popular, uh, if you can identify an, a, an ABC correction after a swing uh, up or down, then I would say go for it. I would say use that particular um, Elliott wave pattern. Okay, any more questions from anybody? Okay, if there if there are no more questions, oh, some some someone else is typing. Here we go. <laughs> Hi, Mohammed. Okay, my pleasure, Mohammed. Thank you very much, and um, uh, there we are. Just. Uh, Just wait for the for this to this one to come through. Okay, so th thank you very much, everybody, for attending, and uh, I hope to uh, hope to see you all through. Uh, see, see you all soon, and uh, again, thank you very much for, uh, for for coming. All the best to you.